We wanna hear the stories from the courses that you've taught. Whether in a lab, a classroom, kitchen, on Zoom or in a shop. Drawing on your expertise, we'll ask the probing questions. What goes right and what goes wrong when teaching your favorite lesson? So welcome everybody to My Favorite Lesson, a new podcast series from teaching and learning at Conestoga. My name is Dr. Lauren Spring, and I'm a teaching and learning consultant with Conestoga College. And today I am lucky enough to be sitting here with Craig Stevenson, who is the coordinator of our Police Foundations program. So Craig, why don't we start off um, by you letting us know a little bit about your journey to Conestoga. Sure. Uh, I've always tell my students that I'm a recovering lawyer because that's what I was um, in the past. And my journey to Conestoga is a little circuitous, if we can say that. I was a practicing lawyer for uh, about 10 years, and I was uh, doing a lot of family law because I had ended up taking over a practice of a lawyer who who was uh, mainly a family law lawyer, and I was really finding myself dissatisfied with what I was doing. And uh, an opportunity came up to do a year-long contract teaching at Sheridan College where their their, uh, law teacher uh, in their business program had to go off on a a medical leave. And he had been a friend of mine and uh, a bit of a mentor, and he says, why don't you come and try this? And I said, oh, that's perfect. I uh, Mm -hmm. sold my practice. I uh, said this would be a great for a year-long break to do something different, and then (laughs) afterwards I'll get back into... uh, into practice, and I, I taught at Sheridan for a year on the contract, absolutely fell in love with, with teaching. Um, from that, moved on and was teaching at Mohawk for a few years on a, a contract basis, and teaching at a, a variety of places and a variety of courses as I, as I tried to put together a portfolio. And I was teaching part-time in business at Conestoga when uh, the chair of the business department called me in and said, you know, there's a full-time position coming up in police foundations. They're looking for a lawyer and I think you'd be perfect for it. Why don't you apply for it? So I did. And, um, that was 13 years ago and it was probably the best decision that I ever, I ever made. It's been a fantastic career change. And every May when, uh, you know, school is done and things have relaxed a little bit. I always text all my friends who are, you know, downtown Bay Street lawyers in Toronto (laughs) and say, you know, I'm going to head home with my laptop and sit around the pool with a drink and and continue (laughs) working um, while you're in your offices down there. Um, And uh, the reaction is usually not complimentary, but uh, it's, (laughs) it's been a great, it's been a great change. It's a great career. And I'm curious to know, so that's a bold decision. So you were practicing law for 10 years, were a little bit disillusioned by it, and then had this contract but sold your practice. It was, it was um, I was lucky in the support that, uh, that my partner, my wife, was uh, fully supportive of it. Mm. Um, we were also, geographically, we were, I was working in one city and she was working in another city. So it was also in the back of our mind that um, it would be, um, a good time for me to change my practice and maybe move closer to where we were living uh, for for a lifestyle reason. And then um, it was uh, her who allowed me to make that that bold choice. I did come back from my my mother was a teacher and my father was a professor uh, Mm. at Sheridan for years. So I had seen what the lifestyle could be like. So it was a uh, uh, an easy decision for me in terms of this is what I want to do. And it was that conversation with my wife when she said, like, what do you want to do? Mm-hmm. I said, this is this is it. This is what I really, really enjoy. I've always loved the law. I didn't love the practice of law. And I think looking back at it, if if I could change what I had done, I would have maybe stayed in the law but gone on and and into more of a formal professorship or and gone and worked at, you know, a non-governmental agency, something like that, where you, you do the law, but you're really making a bit of a difference in the, in the world. So this was a, a, a tremendous change for me. And the, I said the best decision I ever made. And beautiful, <clears throat> sorry, beautiful to have that 
you know, it was kind of a family decision and, and that support. And it sounds like you kind of had teaching in your DNA, having grown up with, with parents in the profession. And I wonder, you said you didn't like the practicing of law. What was it about working as a lawyer that maybe there's multiple things, but primarily, yeah. What You know, when you're doing something like family law, you are really working with people who are going through a tremendously bad time in their life. It is not uh, an easy thing for people to go through a, a, you know, a divorce or a separation and to deal with all those issues. And what I found was that I was getting a little disillusioned by um, the negativity and the pettiness that I was seeing mm. and the, um, uh, just the emotional labor that was being put on to me which I didn't feel I was well suited to give back to people. Mm. And uh, it was just, it was an exhausting couple of years where it was, uh, um, I was doing an area of law that I hadn't really ever gravitated towards, but an opportunity had come up to, to take over a practice like that. And, and as a business decision, it was probably the right decision, but as a personal decision, it was not what I wanted to do with the law because I absolutely love the law. I, I feel really strongly about people need to be represented. They need to have their rights upheld and represented, and they need to be able to make decisions with all the best information in front of them. And, and our legal system allows for that with all of its flaws. Um, but I also think that people don't know what the law is, and that's a, uh, a huge um, issue in our society, that people don't know what their rights are and how to take advantage of their rights so that they can move forward, um, you know, in, in, in their lives. And so I felt that teaching was a little bit more mm. of that. And then especially, again, I was all set to be a professor of law in a business faculty. That's what my background was. Mm -hmm. That's where I was. Um, I had done some criminal stuff, but, but I'd moved mainly towards, you know, civil litigation, business, and then family law. And then when I got into police foundations, I realized I had, uh, a real opportunity to teach people who have a, a very different mindset because police students have a, and police officers have a very different mindset. It's how they can deal with a incredibly stressful job, but I can give them a different perspective on what other people are seeing and what the other aspects of, of their profession entails. And so I, I really feel, you know, maybe it's a cliche, but you, you want to make a difference with what you're doing. And I feel that every day, I get to make a difference. And I have to say, I love this job. Coming in <laughs> front of the, the students is the best part. And I will tell them, you know, I said, you, you'll know when I'm having a bad day because you're the cheapest therapy that I've ever had. I will come in here <laughs> and just let me rant for a bit and we'll talk a bit and, and, and do it. And you get the feedback you get from the students is there's nothing better in this job than going into a class in front of students and being challenged by them and feeling that maybe you've had a, a real conversation with them and and you think a little bit differently and maybe they'll think a little bit differently. It's, it's a fantastic job. And that's so nicely said and I find, I bet a lot of faculty could probably relate to that, the beauty of the profession, right? That there's this vulnerability involved, you're exposed in a certain way in front of the class and and especially that give and take, right? When you do establish a strong relationship with students. Um, yeah, this sort of openness, the sharing, you being open about the affective parts of your life and emotions and things you're going through also allows them to be fully human, you know, when they come into class. And I would imagine impacts what what goes on in the conversations you have and the lessons that are taught and then what they carry forward too. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think oh, my philosophy has always been that teaching, teaching is a very tiring mm -hmm. thing. When you're in front of a classroom, it's tiring. And it's hard to hold up an artifice in front of uh, students for, for two and a half hours. You have to just let your personality come through so that you can actually do the job and not exhaust yourself. Mm -hmm. And they come in and see you and then see you as a little bit human. Um, and it does change that relationship. That's why, again, teaching students who are at this maturity level, who are, you know, kind of expanding from high school and are coming and starting to realize that, uh, that the people teaching them are people too and have something more to offer them than just mm -hmm. facts and figures. And you can build that relationship with those students. And again, it, it, it's a very rewarding career if you're suited for it. Mm -hmm. Some people aren't. And I think that's a, a strength too. You have to realize what you're suited for and, and hopefully find something that 
plays to those strengths and lets you enjoy it. But it said, I have never, in 13 years at Conestoga, I have never had a day where I have not want to come into work. Mm. And I think that's a, that's a, a, a tremendous gift that I've been, been allowed to have. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of people wouldn't feel that way in their the, the careers that they've fallen into or, or chosen. Um, so that is a really special thing. And I wonder, you were talking about this sort of beautiful period in students' lives. So they're in, in the case of police foundations, in many cases, obviously, we've got mature students as well. But um, in many cases, you know, sort of are somewhat fresh out of high school, have made this career decision, work towards, um, you know, applying to this program. What do you think are some of the things that might be surprising to them when they when they start taking courses with you or or other courses in police foundations? I think they would probably be surprised to know that um, I I am a if I had had a dream job when I was 17 it would have been to have been a graphic artist. Mm. I love art. I try to do it. I'm not sure I'm that <laughs> good at it, but it's so so that's something that I I don't think they would realize. Um, they probably also wouldn't realize that I used to win bar bets by being able to say anyone's name backwards. Oh my. <laughs> that, that is very cool. Yeah. It, was, yeah, it, was a, it was an interesting it was an interesting party trick. Was this like an innate talent or it, it actually came out of it was a game my father used to play with us when we were on long car trips. You know, that uh, as we saw signs, you had to be able to say them backwards or you, if, if you heard a name, <laughs> then you'd have to say it backwards. And he taught us all how to say our name backwards um, since pretty much as long as I can remember. And so it was always something that we that we did. And uh, it's again, it's, it's a it's a party trick. It's a little <laughs> it's, it's a little bit different way of thinking when you look at something. And um, and that was uh, that's something I don't think that my students would would expect. Oh, nice. Um <clears throat> And so what are the what are the courses that you primarily teach with Conestoga? So because I'm the basically the staff lawyer in the faculty, I get to teach all of the law courses. So uh, currently this term, for example, I'm teaching uh, a powers and authorities course, which teaches students where the authority of a police officer comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm also teaching a community policing course to our uh, to our graduate students and I've or in our graduates our graduating students. Um, and I teach our investigations and evidence course, which is, uh, again, a great course on the law of evidence and how forensics are used from the field and then taken into the court. So pretty much anything that has law in it, I've had a uh, uh, I've had my hand in developing the course and in in teaching them. And it sounds like, yeah, these are kind of courses taught at different points in the program. So do you get to see students sort of when they're fresh and new in the program and then as they the, as they evolve towards graduation? I do. And that's, it's always when I became the coordinator and our, our new chair who had been the coordinator before, his philosophy, and he told me was that he said, we're always going to try to make sure that in September, you have all of the first years Mm. and then you will have them that term. So you will get to know them and they will get to know you. And he said, and then you will see them periodically as our sections get smaller, but you will see them again over the next year and a half after that. And so it always ends up that in, in first semester, I have all the first years. And then in fourth semester, I usually have all of the, the graduating students also. So I see them at the beginning as a group, and then I see them all again in their last semester here. Very neat. And, and you mentioned as the sections get smaller, is that because some folks realize that this isn't maybe the career they thought it was or not, not quite for them? Uh, we actually don't lose too many that way because students tend to be very committed to policing when they come into it. It's a very focused group. But what happens is our program is designed the first semester, much more general theoretical classes. So you have the larger lectures. And then as they go through, they're getting a more practical application of mm. the of the, uh, the the material in the courses. So, for example, our, our investigation and evidence course in third semester is centered in our investigations lab. So section size has to be smaller to, right. to accommodate <laughs> them into that. And as the program has grown, it's harder for me to have all the students all the time. And so I tend to, um, you know, I'll see one group uh, in third semester, I'll see half the students 
because uh, I just can you know, And then the course that I teach them in their fourth semester, again, is a, more of a lecture-based course, so I can have a big group and see them all again. Very cool. And so, obviously, the name of this podcast series is My Favorite Lesson, and you've brought one of your favorite lessons with you today. So could you let me know um, maybe which course, we could start off with which course this lesson falls into, and then describe what this lesson is that you look forward to teaching every semester. Sure. This lesson would fall into our introductory law course for our students, which would be our powers, authorities, and liabilities course. Okay. And one of the things we try to teach the students is that the law is a language in and of itself, and the words that are used don't necessarily have the same meaning as they would in normal conversation. And in their job, they have to know what those words mean so they can do their job properly. Mm. And the biggest influence on how a police officer does their job is how a court has taken the law and said, well, this is what the law says, but this is actually what it means. <laughs> and that can be done uh, in a beneficial way, and it can also be done in and almost, almost in a way which is almost not understandable mm. <laughs> to people. And so the lesson that I use is a theoretical lesson which goes to the extreme of absurdity to teach them how words can be manipulated in the legal system to get to the result that you want to get to. Okay. So what is this lesson? So this is based on a... Um, a theoretical scenario, a theoretical case that was written in the 60s by uh, uh, some lawyers in Toronto who were teaching at U of T Law School, one of whose brother actually went on to become a television writer and producer in, in Hollywood. So it was a very creative family. Mm. And the, the case itself is called um, uh, Ojibwe and the Queen. And it is... Uh, progressive case study where I release certain pieces of the information to students at certain stages and have them argue through it. But the, the crux of the matter was that in our theoretical scenario, Mr. Ojibwe was unfortunately down on his luck. He had a horse, well, actually it was a pony, and he was not able to afford a saddle for it. So to make it more comfortable, he put a feather pillow on its back. And unfortunately, as he was riding the horse, it broke its leg and he had to have the horse put down. And he was then charged with the crime of killing a small bird. Killing a small bird? Yeah. Because our definition of a small bird, sorry, was um, a small bird is a, uh, any two-legged animal covered with feathers. Ah, so that pillow, that pillow saddle. <laughs> Ex exactly. So what we do in the course is I give them, I give them the, the basic scenario, and then I say to the class, now, you're the defense attorneys. You think this is an absurd charge for your client. You now have to come up with all the reasons why a horse is not a bird. Hmm. And then I let them brainstorm in their small groups and then we come back and they have to present to us all the reasons why a horse is not a small bird, which usually <laughs> runs, you know, that, uh, uh, well, it's not covered in feathers. Uh, it has four legs, not a, uh, not two legs. It, uh, it doesn't have a beak. Mm -hmm. It, uh, has hooves and not, uh, n not, uh, claws or bird feeds. Um, it, uh, um, it doesn't make the same noise mm. as a bird. It can't, it, a bird can't be ridden and yet horses are. So <laughs> they come up with all these, these ideas and, and, and a few more. Uh, so logical arguments and, and that's part one. That's part one. And, and then I say, okay, you've given us all these arguments. Now it's the crown's attorney, crown attorney's turn to, to knock all those arguments out. Okay. And so we start to say, so we put those arguments up on the, on the whiteboard and, and we then say, now you have to come up with how are you going to refute those arguments knowing that your whole point is you have to have this animal defined as a bird for your <laughs> conviction to last or to stick. And, uh, you know, they'll come up with, um, uh, things like, well, um, 
you know, the definition says a two-legged animal covered in feathers, but nowhere does it say that that has to be a natural covering of feathers. Mm. Nowhere does it say that it has to be entirely covered in feathers. <laughs> um, the leg one usually gives them an issue because we then say, but if you, if you have a chicken that is missing a leg, then is it no longer a chicken? Mm. So the law has said two legs, but that's just a guideline. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really firm. So, and it, we'll say, I'll quote the judge from the case. He says, you know, you know, an animal with an animal missing a leg is still no less an animal. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, the, uh, can't, you can't ride a horse. Well, then they all come back with, well, yes, but you can ride ostriches or, um, right. or another big one is, well, birds fly and horses don't. And then they either come back and say, well, you know, unicorns can fly, um, or they'll start going through all the birds that don't fly. That don't fly, of course, you yeah. Know? And uh, that's, we, they really get um, argumentative about it. And, and almost philosophical, too. <laughs> and philosophical, that's <laughs> right. Aristotle trying to classify the universe and the natural world. There. <laughs> exactly, and it's, it's great fun for me because they, they'll throw these arguments up or they'll miss an argument and I'll, I'll throw that argument in or I'll try mm-hmm. to get one group to, to direct their argument directly at the other group, to get the debate going between you know, a couple of groups in the class to see how they can start to think this way. And um, uh, by, the, by the end of it, we, we have to decide, is the definition applicable to our situation? Is this animal that was killed, is it a, is it a bird? <laughs> Under the law. <laughs> Under the law. That's right. And that's fascinating. That's, and that leads us to our next stage, which is, okay, now we go back to the class and I divide them. They're back in their groups, but I divide them. One half is defense. One half is, um, is, uh, uh, is prosecution. Uh, and then we, we say, all right, now you're coming up with your closing arguments, your summation, mm-hmm. where you're going to say, this is what we've talked about and this is why my point is proven. And uh, then we randomly pick two groups and say, you're going to present for the prosecution, you're going to present for the defense, and the rest of the class, they're going to be the judges and they're going to decide who made the better case. Wow. And it ends up every year, it's a little different as to which side wins. There's no, yeah, there's no certainty. Yeah, there's no, no certainty and, uh, and the arguments are, uh, one side is, is stronger than the other, or, or, but you can also always see the students in the class, they will... They're not unbiased. Hmm. They know they've they've picked a side already. So so they're going to go with the 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 people and uh, with the argument that supports what they have been uh, have been feeling all along. Um, Which I mean, this may be an interesting lesson in and of itself, right? When c- contemplating, you know, judges and juries and can people actually be unbiased completely going into a case? Yeah, and that's we we try to talk about that when it when it develops, which is that you can't separate yourself from your own unconscious Mm -hmm. bias. Um, And, you know, some of the students are, they're offended by the absurdity of it all. This this is an absurd (laughs) thing. No, no one would say this. You can't do this. And and they'll look at them and say, well, but remember, we've talked about, we talked about a case the first day of class. We talked about a case where a man was found not guilty of taking, um, of taking pictures of someone without their permission, because the law said you can't take a photograph of someone without their permission. And he used his cell phone and not a camera. And the judge said, well, he didn't take a photograph. He mm-hmm. took a picture. Those are two different things. Wow. And if the law had meant for him not to take pictures, it would have said, don't take pictures. Mm-hmm. So, so the absurdity runs all through, all through the legal system. Yeah. Uh, and you have to be aware of it. Well, I mean, that was one of the, the key questions I had hearing you describe this case and this really exciting lesson is that obviously it's a bit of a silly and playful example but that the implications are much bigger, right? And so students will become engaged in this, I would imagine, um, you know, in part because of the absurdity and how far removed it might seem from a case they might encounter, you know, upon graduation when they enter the police force. And yet the core lesson behind it is, wait a second, be careful. Like what we write down, the laws that are on the books are much different than, you know, we might see them play out in practice or what do these definitions really mean? Exactly. And, and again, it's the, the key lesson is that our laws say one thing, but the application changes how we mean it. You know, again, one of the basic definitions for a police officer is, you know, uh, aggravated assault is assaulting someone with a weapon. 
Mm. And yet in the law, what we mean by a weapon is anything used to hurt someone. So if you throw a cell phone at someone, that's assault with a weapon. That cell phone is now, in the law's eyes, it's a weapon. Right. And uh, it's uh, something for them to think that they have to look beyond, they have to expand the meaning of the words. Mm. I also do tell them that, you know, judges don't make this stuff up. They, they're not told how to define words, but they are told, here's the process that you use to define it. Mm-hmm. So you use one of you you choose one of these processes, and that's actually what a lawyer's job is many times in court. It's saying to the judge, "Well, here's the definition that fits my case, and here's the rule that says you should follow follow this definition, and here's why you should follow it." And then the other side says, "No, no, no, but our other rule says you should define it this way." And it's up to the judge to wow. decide which rule they're going to apply. Man, judges have a difficult job, huh? <laughs> they they do. They do. Mm. But so important. And I I mean, I would imagine you were talking before, too. Obviously, a lot of students coming into the program are, yeah, fresh out of high school and um, maybe have, you know, a passion for justice and an idea of what policing is. To me, it seems like some of these lessons add a bit of nuance, right? That what's right and wrong and what's written on the books is not always as clear as it might seem at first blush. Exactly. And that's, I always tell them, you know, our, our first year law course, the idea is that at the end of the course, they may not agree with everything that the law says, mm. but they should be able to understand why that, that interpretation or application was made. Right. And uh, if they if they come out of the class and can look at a case and say, I don't agree with that ruling, but I understand how they got to that ruling, uh, look at the issue from a different side, I think is a really important thing for our students to get. Yeah. Yeah, that seems so important. And I mean, it's interesting to me, too. So you're saying it's in these kind of three parts, this lesson. Are these in subsequent weeks? No, we, we set it up usually as a, a full two-hour session. So we do it the week before I give them the teaser. I give them, here's the scenario. <laughs> okay. And then uh, you know, they're allowed to read that. And then when they come into class, and I go old school on this, I have it printed out, different color papers, and I said, you're allowed to come, you know, get into your groups, you're allowed to come up and you, you, you start, you take the white paper and then, you know, and then you're going to take the yellow paper and then the blue and then finally the pink paper, whatever it comes in on. Okay. Um, and so they don't see it until, the, and I make them put away all computers mm-hmm. and all access to the internet because this case has been around, you know, for almost 70 years now, <laughs> 60 years. And they, um, uh, they can easily go online and find it. This case has been around for so long, it has actually, even though it's a fictional case, it was actually cited by a criminal court in the U.S. as a persuasive argument in a, uh, in a criminal case. Really? And it, with no awareness that this was a fictitious case used. Oh, my goodness. Law. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it's quite, quite funny to, to think of that. And some of the students still will come up and say, I can't believe that case. I'll say, you, you remember, it was only made up. It didn't actually happen. And, uh, yeah. Wow. Well, clearly some lawyers were confused by it too. So oh, Absolutely. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. And I like what you're describing about those different colors of paper. So um, I would assume that this kind of keeps students on their toes, right? If you're slowly releasing this information, there's probably something skillful in your pacing there in letting that out and be known. It is. And it's to try to keep, keep the lesson going, um, you know, give them enough time to to get first impressions, but not to not to overthink it or not to try to outsmart smart themselves. If I'm feeling devilish, then I'll have them <laughs> change. I'll have them switch papers halfway through and say, "All right, you're going." To. Or if the class is too big, then I'll have them work at, on different parts of the case at the same time and then switch the papers and say, "Now you're going to you're going to argue the other side's point." So when you're writing yeah. these points down, you have to make sure that someone else can understand what you're trying to say, yeah. uh, which they absolutely hate. <laughs> they absolutely. They absolutely hate that um, because I think, I think they're mm. all nervous about their ability to communicate and mm. put ideas down. And yet I find it, it usually they manage to do so. Yeah. And, and there's something to me that's so beautiful about this scenario because it is playful, right? So even though the stakes in the learning are, are it's high stakes and you know, the learning is very clear, um, in some ways, maybe a little bit less stressful because it's not, yeah, like you're saying about assault with a weapon that, you know, is something you may read about in the news tomorrow. I think so. And I think, you know, they come into the law courses always a little bit intimidated because Mm -hmm. it's a very serious subject. Um, This is usually done, um, you know, in the earlier part of the term, 
uh, used to try to do it before Thanksgiving, so they would have something to talk about when the turkey was put on the table. <laughs> Their family's asking, hey, that, what are you doing at school that, these days? <laughs> sorry, you know, I'll say, you, I'll say, you, you, know, you know when that uncle that, uh, you know, talks mm-hmm. too much and too loud is, is going on at the table? Just, this is a conversation to stop him. Just just say <laughs> that you can now define that turkey as a horse if you want to. Um <laughs> But they, it also, I think, is the first chance for them to see that uh, I'm probably not as intimidating as they think I am because mm. of the subjects that I teach. And I don't yeah. think that's a bad thing to humanize yourself with them. And they will, I will have students in second year come up and remind me about this, about this lesson. So it's something that sticks with them, which I think is, is a good indication of how good the lesson is. And I, I, I can only take credit for presenting it. I can't take credit for writing it. It's a fantastic, fun case. Well, that- I think the presentation probably has a lot to do with it too, right? I think, you know, obviously a good lesson can look good on paper, but then it's also about how you bring it to life in the classroom, how you hook students in. And, you know, to me, even when you were saying, oh, I gave, I gave them the teaser the week before, you know, I think that that already probably increases attendance for, you know, the following week when, when you're going to be doing this. I, I think so. And I think, you know, we're not entertainers, but we have to keep the students interested. Yeah. And if you're teaching a three-hour block, it's really hard to keep them interested. You have to use all the variety of teaching methods that, that you know, that are there and doing something different, um, which also makes you excited too. I look forward to teaching this lesson, mm-hmm. I think, as much as the students look forward to, to doing it once they, they get get an idea as to what we're talking about. So it keeps me energized and it keeps them interested. And I think it meets all the best practices of, you know, of teaching and learning that we learn. I mean, I, I took this progressive case study from a teaching and learning seminar that I did like summer, my second summer of, t- of teaching at oh, wow. Conestoga. Okay. So it was a progressive case that was there. And I said, this is a great idea. <laughs> and I, how can I work this into, mm-hmm. into a, into a, a course and, when I decided to, when I created this lesson, I said, this one would be perfect for it. Wow. Well, and it's, you know, it's interesting too, to think about how that kind of excitement that you're talking about in the classroom and how you love teaching this lesson and, and it's almost contagious, right? And I think students can tell that when, when a faculty is really passionate or really excited to share some content or a fun lesson, um, they pick up on that, obviously. They do. I, if I can share one thing, when I was teaching uh, a course at Mohawk as a, a, a part-time instructor, and I remember it was a, a post-grad course, so it was a little uh, more mature students. But I remember at the at the end of the year, the students came up to me and they had a list. They they'd, they'd written down the top ten things they remembered me saying during the term, Aww. and some of them were you know on point on the course, and some were also you know off-topic things. But I thought. Obviously, I was excited in teaching that course, and and what I, my enthusiasm carried forward, and these students picked up on it and remembered things, which I was <laughs> I was really touched by it. I thought, wow, I, I wasn't quite sure anyone was paying attention at some times, but wow. they they were, and you get that feedback from the students, and and it doesn't take much for a professor to be enthusiastic about their sus- subject. Mm-hmm. I think at the very least we can do is go into a class and put an effort into what we're teaching. Right. Even if it's as dry as dust and you know, you know, when we do the historical antecedents of, uh, of criminal law, and I know this is a, this is a long lesson on, you know, 800 years of history that we're going to talk about. I said, I know that this is dry and very academic, but let's be, you know, some enthusiasm about, about the presentation or for the students. I think that's the least we can do yeah. When we're there, we expect the students to come into class prepared and enthusiastic or participatory. We have to do the same thing for them. And sometimes those lessons are a fun challenge too, right? I mean, it speaks to your expertise, I think, in the classroom and, and your subject area expertise as well in the field. But um, to have a dry lesson and take that as a bit of a creative challenge and think, okay, <laughs> this is one I maybe don't look as forward to teaching and I, I risk maybe losing students halfway through. How am I going to bring this to life, add a little bit of oomph um, Admit to students, too, that, you know, maybe I find this one a little bit dry and we're going to work together to get through it in, in some fun ways. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, that's, the, yeah, admitting to them, you, you can't fake it in front of the students. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, to say, yes, this, you know, I hate teaching this or I, I shouldn't say I hate teaching it. I uh, don't 
you know, this is not the most exciting su- subject, but we, we need to have this underpinning before we can move forward. So, so here's how we're going to look at it and let's talk about it. And, you know, and that's, again, when all the stuff that we've been taught as professors through, you know, the teacher training, the teaching and learning and, and things, um, that's when you start to use that to, all right, the material itself is not going to be that grabbing for the students, but let's present it in an interesting way or get them, get them. You know, I, I do, um, I do a lot of things where I put them into groups and then make them pass work Mm -hmm. from one to the other. Um, because I find, you know, that way it, it, it ups their game because they know that they're going to be scrutinized by their peers, Mm -hmm. but it also keeps them that they're getting something new every, you know, here's, so answer a question, then pass it to another group. Now you have to review their answer. Now you're passing it to a third group and that group is now going to have to present that answer. Mm. And so you're all relying (laughs) on each other. um, And it doesn't matter what we're talking about. Just the fact that they have to be alert for that, I think Mm. elevates the lesson a little bit for them. That's beautiful. I mean, when I think about policing too, and how vital kind of group cohesion would be or you know, to me, if yeah, if group number one is passing along what they've written and group number three is going to present it, I feel like group number one would feel some pressure that they'd want group number three to, you know, <laughs> be comfortable up there and seem competent in what group one had written. Um, so to me that, you know, I think in any program or any course, we really stress the importance of peer-to-peer learning and constructivist education where everyone's bringing their ideas and their experiences to the table and it becomes a conversation and an offering. But I would imagine that in policing that that's really vital, that sort of partnership and, you know, protection that that folks might feel towards one another. It is. And it, that's, you know, what's one of the goals of our program is that they have to learn to work in teams. And I also present to them because you know, I'm not from a policing background. I bring a different perspective in. But the police are a part of the web of you know, social harmony, if, if we want yeah. to take it that way. And you are going to be dealing with group, other groups who have a different view but on, this, on, a, on the problem, but are partners to you. And so you not only have to work together as a team yourself, you have to, you have to get along well with others who may not have your <laughs> background or your view on how things should be done. And that's the funny thing I find with police with police and police students, and I've gotten to know a lot of police uh, in the, the 13 years I've been here, is that, um, and we probably shouldn't be surprised by this, they are as varied and interesting as any other group in society, except they pro- present a cohesive front to the public. Right. So it's only when you get to know them that you realize that. And the other thing is, I have yet to meet a police officer who is not extremely caring about other people in the community. Mm. Uh, They may present differently. You may not agree with their solutions, but they really do value individuals Mm. for the most part. And you you sense those hearts in the classroom. You do. You do. And, and, you know, I always ask my students, you know, tell us a little bit on a discussion board, introduce yourself in a little bit what, why you're coming into this program or into policing. And, so many of them say they just they want to help people. And you see that you see the strong commitment to volunteerism mm-hmm. in in police and and in our students. And and it's usually we don't have to encourage our students to volunteer for things because they they're the type of students who they have done that all through high school. OK. You know, even over and above the what the 40 hours they have to do. They really have that interest. And I think, you know, the best police officers just want to help people. Hmm. And that's what we try to to give our students the a way to get, to make that happen. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Craig. This has been a really enlightening conversation, and um, I'm jealous of your students. I would like to be able to sit in on this class and <laughs> argue for one side or another, whether this creature is a horse or a, or a bird. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners before we sign off for today? No, except I'm, I was really honored to be asked to do this, this podcast. And I, I think uh, the more of this that can be done, uh, the better is for people. Because people who like teaching also love to talk about teaching. I've been told that many times when I, you know, at family gatherings to stop talking. Because <laughs> w- I think once you're a teacher, you just want to share, you know, your experiences with, with everyone. So this is a great opportunity. And I, I've been looking forward to this since you invited me. And so thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you for taking us up on the opportunity. And 
I think you're right. I mean, I could talk teaching all day. Um, and there is something, yeah, really, really beautiful about the profession. And I think you've embodied a lot of that in, in what you've shared with us today. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, we have come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. You can find all episodes in this series and more by following Teaching and Learning at Conestoga on YouTube. You can also find this podcast on Spotify and other places you get your podcasts. If you subscribe, you'll be notified each time a new episode becomes available. For 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our Faculty Learning Hub at tlconestoga.ca. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, reminding you, as the great Bell Hooks once said, that the classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. Until next time.